Hi, my name is Bob Grinier and I'm a volunteer with the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. This video called Amazing Tracks is a summary of Parkamov AG, that's Alexander Parkamov's presentation that he gave following my Are We Witnessing Something Strange presentation to the Cold Nuclear Transmutation and Ball Lightning Russian group on 17th of June 2020. And it discussed some of his most interesting tracks and after I have gone through a uh, transcript of his uh, presentation I, in English, I will then look at some uh, other observations uh, that we have observed and others uh, have observed in the field that may go some way to explaining how these tracks formed. So, here we go. Introduction. In our laboratory, not only are nickel-hydrogen reactors tested, but also devices with plasma electrolysis and electro-discharges in gas. And we haven't missed the opportunity to use those, these devices as sources of emanations that form amazing tracks. We used various materials with smooth surfaces as detectors. Glass, mica, metals, etc. Especially suitable detectors were fresh blanks of DVDs, discs with exceptionally smooth surface without scratches and other defects. Such detectors were proposed and successfully used by Vladislav Zhigolov. Most tracks have a simple groove of micron width, but there are also some very interesting tracks. These slides show some of these tracks from our collection. So he has a selection of tracks here. The top one I will just do the exposure to uh, is a fragment of a track on glass and the length of that part of the track is about five millimeters. The one in the middle is a fragment of a track on glass uh, length about eight millimeters. And the one at the bottom is a track on boron nitride, length about 0.2 of a millimeter. And the image above is optical, and the one on the right is from a scanning electron microscope. And I've just noted there uh, that boron nitride is the hardest material other than diamond. Um, and this track appears like a track on lion quartz, which I will show you as we move forward. So the first track, his comments were, the track shown above has a rather simple but strictly periodic pattern. We can imagine that it was formed by some rounded body rolling on the surface. And this is the type of track uh, which is generally seen in the community as tread track. Track on boron nitride, length 0.2 millimetres, and the top image is the optical microscope image and you can see these kind of parallel tracks that we saw on the echo fuel container and on the echo fuel and also on the tracks that I have shared with you in previous presentations to this on the work of uh, Dmitry Baranov on his uh, gold coated silicon uh, alpha and beta particle detectors. The track shown here is much more complicated. It takes a very complicated process to depict it. And on the right here, you can see the scanning electron microscope image. A fragment of the track on glass, length about eight millimeters. Now, you will see that this should actually say in glass. The track here is interesting because unlike all the other tracks we have seen, it is located not on the surface of the detector, but strictly in the middle of the glass plate. So this is inside the glass. Tracks obtained with scanning electron microscope periodically recurring amazing formations on surface of detectors. And he's saying here, there are no identical tracks. Each track is unique. Conclusion. It is difficult to explore a phenomenon that manifests itself so differently. Vladislav Zhigolov has developed an approach that allows quantification of at least the intensity of track formation. 
He recently reported about it at our seminar. His research allows us to draw some preliminary conclusions. 1. Appearance of tracks is not necessarily connected with the operation of reactors. There is a natural background. But near the operating reactors, at a distance of up to 30 centimeters, the intensity of their appearance sharply increases. 2. Even when the reactor is running smoothly, the intensity of the tracks appearing near it changes greatly and unpredictably. 3. Screens made of metal, paper, plastic located between the reactor and the detector do not prevent tracks from appearing. 4. The tracks do not appear in tightly closed containers, but they do if the containers have slots. It's possible that the tracks appear due to dust in the lab. So this is something that uh, has been suggested by the community, and I agree with it. It could be a three-body interaction in some cases. And it could be that whatever is coming out of the reactor is interacting with dust particles and moving them also. So I'm going to address the first one here, because uh, as he said, this could be uh, something rolling along the surface. And uh, we observed these kind of tracks in um, the, a number of different experiments, but uh, I want to focus on uh, Project Omar, which was looking at Omar's gas and uh, the vibrators that produced those. And so there were vibrator plates, and they were held with, uh, so I have a piece of Teflon here, uh, Teflon here with a vibrator plate, and this goes up and down, and uh, there's a steel above and steel below. And in this case, uh, the Teflon was here, and the uh, free plate was over here. And this boundary line is where it was bound, uh, binding the plate inside the, the held area to the free-to-move area. And this track appears to uh, originate, uh, and this is called the Long March track. In fact, it's, as, as far as we're aware, it's the longest kind of track of this uh, tire tread type track that's ever been observed, and you can go and have a look at a video looking at that. But anyway, uh, it appears to uh, be initiated outside of the, um, the held area uh, by the Teflon in the area of the plate that is in contact directly with the water. It then proceeds to go through the boundary and go in between the Teflon and the um, uh, steel plate or the titanium plate whichever it's made of in this case and it goes for a very long way and it has a periodicity of 0.235 millimeters so 235 microns and uh, it has a uh, diameter on the features that you can observe uh, of uh, just around about 100 microns and so you can imagine something rolling around here so if it was a crystal and it was rolling it would leave this track um, but uh, uh, there we have it. And um, before this was observed, uh, there, the previous day, there was observed this track. And the interesting thing about this track is that it was observed here. And you can see in the video live the observation of this and how the polarization of the light enables the uh, track to be uh, visible. Um, but it, it's uh, unique in that it's the first ever track to be observed to originate inside a cavitation spot. So here is the center of the cavitation spot. So this is the cavitation area. And so this is the cavitation spot. So it's, it's been born here and it goes out here. And in fact, it almost looks like it joins up to another spot over here. But certainly it, it comes out of here. And it's, it's like a, a broken spiral. Uh, it might be uh, two uh, EVOs, if there is EVOs that are causing this, that are spinning around each other. And uh, they get to a point where neither of them are in contact with the plate. And then the next uh, one of the pair becomes in contact with the plate. So you get this kind of spiral thing and where each alternate one is actually caused by one side of the EVO. So it's a, the most basic type of EVO pairs that, that Ken Shoulders observed a lot of. And so these are potential ways that you can explain... Uh, 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 these are other examples. Um, however, in this case, like I say, this, this area is only in the uh, uh, solution. Uh, there's no uh, 
um, Teflon above it and in this case uh, it started in the solution and then went under the Teflon with, without any real change into the periodicity um, and so that's an interesting itself and, and the fact that it was born in a cavitation spot. Now moving on um, the, the argument about these only being produced uh, uh, according to dust or, or particles um, and three body interaction kind of falls apart when you look at uh, these tracks uh, here and this this was observed from echo fuel now we've talked about echo fuel uh, recently with re regard to tracks that formed on the inside plastic of uh, the fuel container and also in some pet bottle that was about an inch away and apparently guided by a, uh, a magnetic field but anyway this is a 910 logitech c camera and in fact i have it here it's this camera here and you can see it's a bit beaten up now because it's been used. And that is uh, covered in uh, tape, Teflon tape in this case. Uh, so this is polytetrafluoroethylene tape. That might be important that it has the uh, uh, fluorine in there uh, because I've talked about that recently. Uh, and so that is covered over and then the masking tape. And this is held um, either straight down or an angle. And the idea is that using a program called Cosmic Ray Finder, uh, emissions coming out here... Uh, that can interact with the um, sensor will leave a track and this is one of the tracks that was observed it is uh, uh, this is let's say one segment uh, kind of similar to the one segments you have here um, and its peri period is is 100 microns as observed uh, by knowing the number of uh, pixels in the sensor and so you know the pixel size so you can work out exactly how long the track is and without any rotation or anything, it's overlaid onto the lion track, uh, which uh, if you go and look at the link here, you can see this is the most detailed uh, periodic uh, strange radiation track uh, that has ever been observed uh, under a scanning electron microscope. And it's in a very purely flat, completely glassy phase um, copper oxide uh, sort of material. And uh, it has these paw prints of of the track, and in every aspect of it is is mirrored by this structure. Now, um, what could be producing these? So, essentially, what I'm saying is, it is utterly impossible that uh, this is produced by a piece of dust. It's actually uh, sealed inside uh, this uh, camera. So, you know, it had to go uh, through the plastic possibly through this paper through the ptfe through the glass uh, through the uh, ir filter through the uh, uh, lenses lens different modules and and to get all the way into the sensor so the idea that a piece of dust got in here and produced this particular track in uh, one i think it's like it produced 120 frames a second it's basically uh, an impossibility uh, and so uh, this is the same kind of structures, same kind of periodicity um, that you observe in these tracks, but um, uh, produced uh, in a uh, webcam. Now, how could this occur? Well, uh, these are structures that were observed uh, on the uh, Amasa uh, Project Omar vibrator plates also. And you can see the kind of setup here with this vibration system. And they have these kind of like bubble-like features. I call them bubbles, but, you know, that's what they look like. And they have these particular angles on them. And this is from, and they have this kind of field around the outside. And this is one from 1993 in Journal of Fusion Technology uh, with these same kind of like uh, structures, which are... Um, Matsumoto called itonic beads and that these are the electrons that form this mesh-like structure that helps compress the uh, material inside. And if you take this and you imagine this structure or, or this structure rolling around uh, on our sensor, you would end up, and in fact the angles are basically the same, you would end up with this structure. And if you took this same kind of structure and then you rolled it around over your material here, you would again end up with these kind of structures. So yes, a crystal could produce this. Um, and, and then the interesting thing is that uh, uh, Bogdanovich et al. 
using uh, high uh, uh, DIDT discharges through a water stream produce these structures. And I will read this again. I've said it in other presentations, but I, I will read it again. A stream of particles, presumably electrons, which causes air to glow. A similar pattern is observed after the emission of electrons from the electron source or their injector through the foil is emitted from the surface after from the surface okay so that's very similar to something being emitted from this surface after the cavitation strike after 10 to 20 seconds this stream is formed into a set of several rings five or six of the same diameter which rotate around both their own and common axis parallel to the plane horizontal so we've got our plane of our material here let's say and we've got these structures, and each of the individual structures are rotating around their axis parallel to the plane. So actually, if there was an axis here, it would be rotating here. And then the whole structure would be rotating around its axis. Now, if you imagine that thing, um, it could just move across the surface, producing one type of track. But if it was rotating itself, it would produce another type of, type of track. And if it was rotating this way or this way, because the... The axis of rotation is this way. If it's, if it's rotating this way, it'll produce lines. But then if it's rotating, it'll also produce 90-degree um, uh, kind of lines. And when you compare all of these things that are going on, you could end up by explaining the kind of tracks you're observing here. Uh, and it would give some you know, understanding to how you could create something with such kind of like smooth, chopped-out material. But... Um, in boron nitride, the, the second hardest substance known to man, <laughs> you know. So, um, uh, depending on, you know, what part of the structure here, let's say, uh, and maybe these are related, but if this is rotating around and uh, substructures within it are rotating around and maybe it's something to do with this field. I mean, this is an object that, that has died. Could this be the kind of structure that it looks like when it's alive? And if that's the case and you have these rotations within rotations and then you, are, you can either have a translation of this body or a rotation of this body in itself in either common access to any of the sub-rotations, um, you can imagine that, you know, you can have something that's rotating this way but there's aspects on it that are rotating that way. And where have we seen this before? Well, uh, I'll come to that in a second. But... If you take this particular structure here and you were to have a surface and, and you've got uh, rotations this way, or let's say the rotations this way, and uh, the whole thing is rotating there. So you've got a big macro rotation and rotations with the sub substructures, and then it comes into a surface. Could you end up with something that you are seeing here? You have the macro rotation producing a circle, but the sub rotations of something when it's dying, let's say the, the main part stops rotating, but the, the, then it kind of pauses, and then the sub components uh, continue to rotate. You have these curved sections here, and these curved sections here that ends up looking a bit like a hexagon. But if you look at the outside, you can see it's like a, it's got a structure in the middle here, and then substructures around it. And this is in the lion quartz um, reactor. And again, it's a pair of two. So if you can imagine this whole structure is rotating as it goes along, that, that would be like a, a, an Evo pair. Um, that, that uh, Like here, these two, if they were rotating along. But they didn't rotate, in my view, in this case, because the B field of the uh, solenoid, the heater coil, was going down here. And this is 50% up the, the, the line, exactly in line with the B field. So the B field stopped this thing spinning around, let's say, um, and it got it trapped, but it continued to burrow into the material as its substructures were rotating, both the substructures there and the substructures uh, within that overall thing. And so if you go to the, the next one here, you can really see it. You've almost got like two Evos here that are rotating around and coming to their final demise. And you've got this rotating around and this rotating around. So, And then the whole thing, as I, if you look from the backside, is rotating around and sweeping this around here. And I believe, and I, say, I said this before, you'll have mostly carbon in the, the synthesized elements here. And it might be synthesized or it might have been carried from the carbon that's in the gr diamond inside the reactor. And then these, I imagine, are silver or copper oxides. Uh, which were captured in, in, and placed into the middle, being heavier elements. And so, you know, th this is uh, one example I see of a structure like this and some of its modes of rotation. And then, again, we, we come back to this one. 
And again, you might have something that's rotating like this as it's going along here, or it might be it might just be translating along here whilst it's all the modes of rotation are like that, and and then something's going this way. I mean. It needs to be something like that to create this. And, and again, this is on the quartz from uh, Lion as well. And uh, this could be seen as a series of parallel scratches. They are parallel scratches, a bit like we've seen in a range of systems. But within the substructure of one scratch, uh, you've got a channel that's bored uh, by something. Uh, and then within the channel, you have alternate uh, 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 period, periodi periodic, rather, uh, um, cuts into the material. So this cut goes up to here, this cut comes to here, this cut comes up to here, this cut comes d down only as far as this, this cut comes up to here. So it's very, very interesting. And it, it could be that, that you literally have um, something like you see here on this Evo. So um, this, this is one structure. Uh, with a group of structures around it. So let, let's say it's, a, it's a more like a 2D plane structure. But if you can imagine this more circular thing was rotating around and this one was rotating around, this one actually has a, three substructures within it. So as that rotates around, it's going to cut on here maybe and cut on here and cut on here. So it may be able to create these offset uh, um, cut lines as the thing travels down in this direction. And so we know it can cut into material. Here it is, a similar structure to the one observed by um, uh, shoulders, cutting into the quartz. In fact, this is the same quartz liner. Um, this, this is the quartz liner I'm talking about in, in the little robot reactor. So um, it's cutting into this quartz liner, the same quartz liner as this. And you can go and see that in the video. And, and, and in these cases, again, if you had a large structure that's coming along and it has a substructure that, that it has, you know, maybe some variance in it like this. Imagine that spinning around, but rather than landing here, it's gone at an angle like that. And it's going along like that. And it's not rotating necessarily like that, but the substructure is rotating. <laughs> you could end up with these kind of uh, um, tracks. And so um, it's not inconceivable, but you... The, the complexity of which uh, Shoulders said here, um, <laughs> when one views the complexity with which EVs can arrange themselves, it engenders visions of complex electronic systems that manufacture themselves at electronic rates. Um, these tracks are likely to have been created at fantastic speed. Uh, and the things that are clustering together and uh, here uh, to do the actual damage uh, here, for instance, uh, and here, um, are doing the damage extremely, extremely quickly. And so they're made, they're born, they're energized, they come in, they're held in place by the field, they do their sweeping in a circle, and then they die on the major rotation, the sub-rotations slow down, uh, and uh, you could end up with something like this. So I think these tracks that are observed are these ones, these ones, and these ones could be explained uh, by um, uh, the sort of complex uh, rotations and uh, sub-rotations and translations within uh, complex uh, exotic vacuum objects. And this is why you call it exotic vacuum objects. You know, there are many, many <laughs> objects that you can construct out of the same basic substructure. Um, the most likely to be a straight three-body interaction are these. However, as I say, this is born out of a, um, uh, a cavitation spot. And the kind of spiral form that you see here is very similar to the same uh, system that it has these structures. And the spiral form was observed by uh, Leclerc in many examples. And it is impossible that this both in the lion uh, quartz and in the lion, uh, sorry, and in the echo fuel uh, observed on uh, the uh, webcam, it's impossible that they can have been produced by um, uh, dust particles. And the periodicity and the overall structure and the angles uh, play to the same tune. Now, lastly, there is this one that that is 
uh, for Alexander Parkamov, the biggest mystery here. Now, I don't know quite, I can't quite work out whether I'm looking at uh, a channel that's been bored of a specific width. Now, in the same line quartz that we saw this, we had this. This is a channel, and it's exactly the kind of width of a an Evo, and it tra travels, I think, eight centimeters up the quartz, all the way through its depth. And periodically, there are uh, crystals uh, that are deposited. And I surmise that the Evo was traveling up, and, and it got to a certain carrying load, and it had to dump some of the material in it in order to proceed. And uh, I see something potentially similar happening here. But the, the, the actual structure itself, um, uh, with these hard lines here, and these kind of like crystal grains here, and this radial feature here, um, it, it, it points to maybe something else that's going on. And I looked into the literature to find out any other examples. And the closest thing I could find uh, that may be of worth uh, consideration is this. Uh, now, this is actually a channel that was deliberately made um, by uh, Ken Shoulders. And it was, was as a guide for an Evo. And then what he did is a cover plate of the same kind of alumina was deposited on the glass and is used to close off the top of the re rectangular channel. In the particular experiment run here, the channel depth was not adequate and the cover plate was attacked by the EV. The result of this attack is shown in this figure. It can be seen that heating has produced shrinkage cracks in the alumina film. Now, we know that an EV will create a, a channel. And here it's created what appears to be a very specific width channel, which has very, very hard, clean lines, but it does go through the whole material. Could it have been, a, and in fact, in Lion Reactors, we've also had uh, seen where the, the Evos have bored through part of the way through the, the, the quartz, and then they've exploded and they've produced a track similar to the one that you see uh, here, uh, uh, or if you took this away, where, where you have these zigzags going on, uh, on, on the edge of the quartz. So we, we know that Evos can get into the material. In fact, in, in Ken Shoulder's books, he talks about one of the ways to, to make a porous uh, thing is to get a, a Tesla discharge and, and fire, fire holes through a, a ceramic a glass or whatever. Uh, to make a, a a thing to to as a, a porous uh, <laughs> like gas ejector, um, he actually describes that. He's in a similar area to this part of the book, but um, yeah. So uh, <laughs> the very specific width here is not unsurprising, uh, given what was observed in Lion uh, uh, when we look at this. A very 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 similar observation. And what might have happened is that uh, the Evo got to a point in the glass where uh, it found some um, change in um, uh, resistivity or some air bubble or whatever. And it kind of started to be activated uh, at that boundary, at that impedance boundary. And then it just moved off in a direction. And as it did so a similar effect was created to what was observed here in the 1980s by Ken Shoulders. So there it is. There are a range of tracks, um, the, some of the most interesting observed by ourselves and by other authors. There are potential ways that these could be produced by uh, rotation of 3D crystal structures like this uh, in this paper and 2D bead structures like this and sub-rotations within those. And I've described how when something impacts a material, in fact, Ken Shoulders says this himself. He says uh, um, something, uh, some, in one of these things, he says, basically, if you want to s slow these things down, you, you imp impact them onto something. Uh, and so you can imagine these things rapidly slowing down. And so is that what we are observing here, where the, the bulk structure slows down and then the substructures slow down and you end up by seeing this uh, beautiful sort of fractal cauliflower image so there we go. I think uh, I would love to hear your comments on this and, and uh, see what you think. Uh, go and have a look at all of the videos where these things are discussed, how they were discovered and, uh, and, and so forth. But I, I think we're really getting to the bottom of how these wide and varied and sometimes amazing structures, I mean, on boron nitride is just amazing, inside glass. Um, you know, how these things are made 
and uh, uh, it really is a pleasure to be able to study this uh, work and I, I just I, I'm really looking forward to the day that uh, it, there are more people um, in other institutions that uh, are able to take on board the work of Ken Shoulders and people like um, Dmitry Baranov uh, and what they have observed and uh, get to the bottom of the exotic vacuum object uh, mystery and start to learn about the potential that it can provide us in a wide range of fields from propulsion to uh, um, radiation remediation to energy production to elemental synthesis. So thank you very much for your time and I will see you in the next video where I will be talking about uh, microwave plasma pulses uh, that are sent through uh, polymer, polymer um, uh, capillaries uh, the work that was conducted in the 1980s, before even Pons and Fleischmann, where the uh, plasma actually splits into three components, and uh, you can see uh, Evo-like structures. And this work was presented by Klimov, and when I saw it, it was just it was just stunning. And and that is why Klimov asked me the question he did at the end of my presentation because he said yes I can see that there's a magnetic component to these structures but there also seems to be an, an, an electro uh, uh, electric component that that can be influenced by electricity and I want to discuss the aspects of that so please join me for that next presentation if you don't subscribe uh, and you haven't subscribed please consider subscribing and if you wish to support this work uh, links for that will be in the description of the video see you in the next video